I had an advertising agency. I was in that business and uh, from 1966, and um, that is how I got to be familiar with Mission Viejo. Was and this your own advertising company? Yes. Okay. I, at one time, when I first began with Mission Viejo Company, I worked for someone, a Prescott Company, and then during that, in that interim, uh, 1978, I formed my own advertising agency, and Highlands Ranch became my client. Mm -hmm. But before that, Mission Viejo Company uh, in Aurora, their community in Aurora, was a client. Okay, well, let's start with that chapter of your life. How did you come to get involved with Mission Viejo Aurora? Uh, we had a very deep involvement with a lot of builders in Denver. It was a specialty of the particular advertising agency that I was working for at the time. Um, it wasn't the only clients that we had, but they were. that was a, a specialty. And because we had familiarity with the house, home, new home construction in Colorado, Mission Bay Hill came to us and asked us if we would be interested in talking to them. We were, of course, we were at the end of a long series of advertising agencies that they had gone through and they had never quite discovered the successful formula that they had in California. And a lot had to do with the product they were building and, and also a, a people not knowing who Mission Viejo Company was. They had a sterling reputation in Southern California, but not so much a, a reputation in compared to some of the Colorado builders who were far better known than Mission Viejo Company. So There was certainly some don't Californicate Colorado attitude in the early 70s. Absolutely. We had a governor that um, was uh, led, led an entire band on don't have, if you don't build it, they won't come. We didn't build it and they came anyway. So You're speaking of Dick Lamb, I assume. I am speaking of Dick Lamb and, and then the successor, Roy Romer, um, mm -hmm. who happened to be the governor at the time when Mission Viejo Company uh, bought Highlands Ranch and, and became um, the developer. What made your, uh, the agency that you worked with so special at that point relative to home builders? Uh, it was simply experience. We understood what it took to, what, where the buyers were and what their, what motivated them at the time. And um, agencies tend to group by specialties. And, um, we, as I said, we did other things. We did a lot of banking and we did fast food. And we did the typical retailers. At, um, home builders were a particular specialty of, of not only the agency but of mine particularly. So uh, we, we talked to Mission Bay, California about Colorado project in Aurora um, and gave them our best perspective of what perhaps the, a tweak in the product change that they, they might make that would uh, be more successful as it turned out. They began to turn around that project very nicely. At the same time, the land became available um, in Highland, in what is now Highlands Ranch. The Phipps Ranch. The Phipps Ranch. Um, and they began looking at it as because they had the resources and the experience to develop that kind of property. 22,000 acres is I understand that was double amazing. the size of the property in California. Yes, exactly. About 10,000 10, acres. I Aliso Viejo, there's just the property across the highway, uh, the freeway from them would bring it to about 11,000, I think. Who did, you, who did you work with here with Mission Viejo, Colorado? Um, it, to begin with, there was a man, man named Pat Farrell, who uh, is deceased, but Pat had worked in California. Um, consequently, we got to know all the people from California. He was brought out from Mission he, Colorado he, or California. He was brought out from California to Colorado. This is Max, by the way, this little creature that is coming and going through the... Yep. Um, and how was he to work with? Pat Farrell was an, an outstanding personality. He was a, a very large person. He was a former Marine pilot, mm -hmm. full of himself, very attractive gentleman and uh, th and knew how to build houses and knew what was what was called for how to win this war in California and he, but he also knew to listen to us and so he did and he gave us a fair shot at that and he called it was a kind of an interesting story he called me one morning and he said 
I would like you to have a charter an airplane, and I would like you to, uh, I said, we're flying, where are we going? He said, I can't tell you, I cannot tell you anything. We just have the airplane on a Saturday morning and have a very good photographer with long lens cameras. So I said, okay, yes, sir, it, we can do that. So we met at Centennial Airport, um, which at the time was Arapahoe County Airport, and we took off and the pilot kept saying, where are we going? And he said, you just fly across the highway here. And I realized that we were flying around. I said, oh my gosh, that's the Phipps Ranch. And he said, how do you know? What <laughs> I said, because everybody in Douglas County knows about it. County Which year was this now? Pardon? Which year was this that the flight occurred? Uh, probably 1978. Okay. Early, early 78. Um, and we um, looked at it and did all the photography. And then the game was to put it together into a slide presentation that Phil Riley was going to take to New York and to present to Philip Morris to see if they would be interested in it. At the time, I, I believe the Highland Ventures had purchased the, the property, and so it was a it was a arrangement that um, that the Mission Video Company was looking at because Highland Ventures, I think, probably didn't have the wherewithal or the the um, the knowledge to build out that kind of community. That, that's really a city when you're when you're doing dealing with twenty two thousand acres. So. Um, at any rate, we, we worked over the weekend, put together a slide presentation. Phil flew through Denver on Monday morning, I believe, Tuesday morning, on his way to New York, picked up the slide. And in those days, it was carousels. There was no such thing as putting it on a digital. It was in, in the carousel. He picked it up, took it with him, and off he went. Um, to And Philip Morris agreed to that they would be interested indeed in, in, in this project. That's for the uh, oral history's benefit, Phil Riley was a principal in Mission Viejo. He was the president of and the Mission Viejo Company. Philip and Jim Morris Tepper had, was the, <clears throat> the chief planner. And Philip Morris at some point <clears throat> bought Mission Viejo? Yes. In, I believe, 70, early 70s, I believe, 70. And Highland Ventures was originally the outfit that was formed when Marvin Davis yes. bought the Highlands Ranch yes. after the death of Lawrence Phipps II in the middle of 76. Yes. And proceeded to market the property. Do you Some know how... That could be. Was it because of Pat Farrell or were you or anyone else that... I think his... California people heard of the availability of the Phipps property. Uh, I think they heard of the, the availability. I think Marvin Davis probably reached out to somebody who had some ties to Colorado who had the wherewithal yeah, because to, at that to point, be able to buy it and the knowledge to be able to develop it. Yeah, at that point, uh, Pat Farrell was already here. Yes. So yes. I assumed he might have had some involvement in letting the California people know that uh, the property in, might be available. Indeed, he may have. I, I do not know that. There is a picture that's blown up on a large poster board in the Highlands Ranch Mansion from the east facing west and you see lots of fields mm -hmm. you see the mountains in the background and you see the east ranch buildings and then the mansion right. in the midst of the trees i suspect those are the pictures that are taken from that airplane yeah on your trip yes yeah. Yeah. at that point well that's good so my understanding, it was sometime in the early part of 78 that the transaction closed and Mission Viejo got the keys to the, the Phipps Ranch. Is that your understanding too? Um, I, that would be, I think the public announcement was in s later than that. Um, but I'm not, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just not sure. I'd have to go back to old calendars yeah. and, and look to, to see. I. It was that was the approximate time. Okay, so Mission was a very new owner of yeah. this property, the Phipps Ranch. James Michener had written the book Centennial on a fictional history of the state of Colorado. It came out in late '74. 
wildly popular in Colorado, of course, also nationally, and NBC Universal uh, decided to make what turned out to be a 26-hour miniseries based on that book. They started filming in the Tetons with James Michener is doing the introduction in the fall of that year, and then proceeded to start doing the first chapters of the book. Hoskinel, all the French Trapper on the Platte River, and all those early chapters in really early in the years. When did you get involved in helping with some of the filming down here at the Highlands Ranch Mansion. We had a call from Mission View who said that they had been offered this opportunity. And I believe that may have been through Phil Riley and through connections with Marvin Davis, who was involved with, uh, with uh, Universal Studios, I believe. So certainly with Hollywood, I'm not sure of the studio. But who had contacted and asked about it because the producer, the director, had seen the mansion, the Phipps mansion, and imagined that that's what Michener was talking about when he envisioned and wrote about um, the, the, the house and the, the mansion in Centennial, and asked if they could use it. Mission Viejo had said, we turned them down, we said no. We said, can we, may we ask you to reconsider it, because this is a perfect opportunity for you to get the community, to know the community better and for the community to get to know you better. They, uh, they uh, see you as a California developer. This would be a, a wonderful opportunity to introduce Colorado to Mission Viejo and vice versa. So they said, we'll think about it. It's way ahead of our planning and we're, we don't like to do things. Mission Viejo is a very deliberative company and they always like to know exactly where they're going and what they're going to do. Um, before they before they go public, uh, and they had not even begun to complete the planning of it. So we said, you know, with all of that being said, it's very important in Colorado to to know who Mission Bay is, the company, and the backing of it, and the, just the simple uh, strength of your company. So they said, well, think about it. Well, tell us what kind of proposal you would do. So what, what would you, how would we be involved? So we be put together a proposal that said, let us entertain people for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If the movie company will agree that we can be there for breakfast and lunch at least, and then have one grand party at the end. And they, so the movie, they said, oh, okay. They were interested in it, Mission Viejo, they, and that they would talk to the movie company. The movie company agreed as long as we didn't interrupt the movie scheduling to allow people to come, a certain amount of people, I think the number was 25 or 30, they would be able to use their canteen and be able to have breakfast with the stars and then observe the movies as they were being filmed. And then they would um, be able to do lunch with the stars and observe again in the afternoon. And then we would have one closing party at Benefit Ranch. Our first assignment after the announcement that, that Mission Viejo had bought Highlands Ranch was there was a great furor about California developers and, and it was basically a very much of a no growth time in Colorado. So our job was to keep them out of the newspaper and to keep them quiet, which is why Centennial was an, a disruptor, if you will, in that they came in, in during that silence, that, that dark year, and they didn't want to be too loud about what they were doing, but they, they understood our point of view that it would give them a, a platform from which to tell their story, but they were, um, it was a, a, not, a, not according to the plan. We had just finished buying the ranch. Maybe you know this one done. And Universal Studios was to move in and start filming Centennial. Mm -hmm. I get a call from our attorneys. 
sits on the other side of the ranch. He said, he what? He's at the gate with two mounted cowboys with guns. And he, I said, what's he want? I said, we had, that's, that's our ranch. Mm -hmm. He wants 10,000 bucks. I said, okay, all your equipment's on the street, right? All the big trucks, ready to move up here. And I said, tell him we'll pay him his 10,000 bucks. And, uh, and uh, but anyway, so he was very strange. I was giving a very uh, kind of important report to uh, the TV channels and the radio stations downstairs in the one room there. Mm -hmm. It was all full of all these important people. You know, that went, so I'm giving the presentation and pretty soon my secretary, Barbara, comes in and uh, Mr. Teffer, what is it, Barbara? Mr. Phipps has to see you. I said, well, I'm in, right in the middle of this presentation. He insists on seeing you. I said, gentlemen, ladies, would you excuse me? So I went over to the doorway and you, I'm sure everybody's here. I said, what is it, Lawrence? You're ruining my ranch. He said, what? You're ruining my ranch. You've got trucks running all over it. Well, I said, you know, it's not your ranch. We bought it for 23 million bucks. We're allowing you with a, a grant to graze cattle on it. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me that you think they're destroying your feed, right? Yes. I want them out of there. Well, that did it. So realize that your job was to manage the crowds and the things on behalf of the client during the filming. We heard there might have been a grass fire under the parked cars that were allowed onto the property. Tell me about that. A, uh, our cook and I were surveying the property. We had everybody settled in, I believe, for lunch. And we were looking and somebody's catalytic converter. I was very dry, had started the the meadow in the front, in front of the mansion on follow you could just see a little bit of smoke and Art reacted like gangbusters and there was, they had all the fire, the water trucks and they, they were well prepared. I, I don't know whether they had, the movie company had done that or whether Mission Viejo had done that. I suspect it was the latter or a combination, a cooperative. That fire was out in such a big hurry that, and the cars moved with the greatest dispatch in the whole wide world. You, if you blinked, you might have missed it. So, but it was a great. The art was his usual, very cool self. We can handle this. Got it under control. What were your favorite memories of being on present during the filming? Uh, probably the all-time funny story is when Vanessa Redgrave and, and I forgot, I can't tell you who this, she was the primary star, but there were two or three other. They were shooting a movie right by the columns on the front porch of the Highlands Ranch mansion. And all of a sudden, there was all this stir and everybody was screaming, including Mr. Redgrave. And what the camera lights had had in, got enlivened an entire hive of bees that had been buried in the wooden <laughs> banister, uh, the the beams, and the and the and the bees were all out flying and and buzzing and swarming everybody, and everybody escaped inside. And, Everything was fine except the movie. It stopped the movie production. The director was furious. Money, time is money. They absolutely said, "Fix it." You know, this your it's your responsibility. So somehow, Mission Viejo was able to get Art Cook save the day. It was on the scene. He was able to get somebody to come down and capture all the bees and. Nobody wanted to kill the bees for sure, and so they were, the bees were all gathered up and taken off to some place wherever happy bees go. Um, and, and then the movie, the, set, the scene could resume the next, the next morning, but uh, or the next day. Jim Tuffer hired Art Cook to come out from California to be the ranch manager and the community spokesman. So. You were still 
employed in California by Mission Viejo Company. How did you come to become to Highlands Range in Colorado? Well, uh, I got this call from Jim Tefford. And he was in February. And he says, hi, Art. And I says, hi, Jim. And he says, I'd like you to come to Colorado. Well, you know, I'd been there, as I just mentioned, for the uh, activity program. I thought, oh, good, I'm going to get to do another little trip over there and have fun do, putting on some kind of a program. And, uh, of course, by that time, he had been here a year because they had done the development plan for Highlands Ranch. They bought the ranch and they spent a fantastic year with his planners going over the uh, development plan. They finished it and uh, they were excited about it. And he called me and said, I want you to come over to Colorado. Well, sure, Jim, when? I was thinking again for another weekend type thing, maybe. And I said, sure, well, uh, what, what, do you want, what do we need? No, I want you to move over here. Oh my, okay, <laughs> uh, let me think about that. For, for how long is that thing? And I said, oh, well, okay. I said, let me talk to Pat and everything and make sure that I'm uh, making my, uh, what am I gonna do over there? Well, you've got to, we need somebody over here that's not shy, who will uh, be able to talk. To, we're introducing the program now, the development plan through the numerous jurisdictions. It's gonna go through the county, through state agencies, through districts and everything like that. And we also need, we've got the planners that do that, but we need someone to talk to folks who are just interested in the community, interested in what's gonna happen. Because once it hits the jurisdictions, then it goes public and people are gonna say, what in the world are you gonna do, you know? Don't Californicate Colorado was the way that they wanted to make sure it didn't happen. So they wanted someone to come over to take the exhibits, the develop, pre-development plan, and describe what was going to happen and, and this fantastic property of Highlands Ranch. That kind of brings you up to date a little bit about, uh, I think I did mention to you when I hired Art Cook, brought him, not hired him, but brought him over from California. And I needed somebody badly that I, you know, and I said, Art, come on over, you're going to be in charge of community relations and you're going to be in charge of uh, uh, personnel and uh, office services. And uh, we've been there about, a, he'd been over there about a week, and I said, Art, where are the desks? I forgot it, Jim. He said, Jim, I don't like being in personnel and office services. What do you want to do? I just want to be out on the ranch. I said, okay, get out there and stay out there. And he became our ranch manager and took care of all the ranching operations and because uh, Phil would come over and, and talk with me, and how are things going? And naturally, everything was going beautifully. I didn't, I never, you know. And uh, so we're sitting there talking. He said, I want to talk about ranch operations. Get Cook over here. So I got Art. And Art said, he says, Art, how are things going? He said, beautiful. Just made a sale. We did this, with this, with this, with this. And making money. And uh, uh, one of the things, uh, uh, Phil, that we did, we just bought a big cutter a big new cutter and it'll make our when we create wheat or the haystacks it makes them into the round big round things he said well that's great art but those are big equipment and they're expensive how do you get the big things where you want to care well we bought a truck i said well where did you get the money from the truck and I'm sitting there sheepish, but <laughs> I don't know what he, and Art just kind of did his thing. He didn't do that afterwards, <laughs> but it was, uh, Art was, uh, and you must ask him that when you interview him. Did you have latitudes you weren't given to, you know, did you spend money you shouldn't have spent, Art? Did you? Not me. Uh, you know, it's, it's so funny the things we, during the dry season, we, um, I bought a, a water truck, so in case of fire, which were, you know, easy to catch fire on a, on a prairie out there, and uh, we had a cold spell, and then we had a fire. 
and they hauled the machine out there and it turned out it was all frozen. The whole thing. <laughs> so that, that's when we ended up going to a contract with Littleton Fire Department to get, get some good fire service. About to get some thoughts from an early executive with Mission Viejo here named Joe Blake. So Joe, thank you for coming and sharing some thank thoughts you, about your earliest memories in the almost 20 years that you worked for yes. Mission Viejo, who eventually then became Shea Homes. Right. So it was perfect. How long did you work there? I worked there for about three, three and a half years. And then uh, the man who was general counsel for, uh, for HUD started a mortgage insurance company. And he asked me to come with him and start the office here, which I did for three or four years. And it was during that time uh, that I that I heard, you know, that that Mission Viejo, which had been building this community in Aurora, Mission Viejo, Aurora, uh, had been looking at the possibility, and then of course did uh, take an option on the Marvin Davis option about the acquisition of Highlands Ranch. I assume you knew Pat Farrell? Uh, I did. And, um, but the man that I knew uh, who brought me the, the opportunity to be with Mission Viejo was Jim R Richardson, Nicholson, Jim Nicholson, who uh, was practicing law with the law firm that Mission Viejo was using to get its entitlement started, to get its planned unit development approved. And, and Jim called me and said, hey, Joe, they're looking for someone with a legal background, someone who's been familiar with, uh, with local government and, and uh, has, deals with the legislature. And also, they'd like to have someone who's kind of a local boy who can help uh, guide them around on some of the local issues here. So This was 78, 79? This was 1979. And um, had they had the development plan approved yet? No, they were still going through that. They were they were just finishing up. They had, as I recall, they had taken this option on Highlands Ranch in uh, in 19, uh, 1978 uh, with the understanding that they had, would have two years within which to get the planned unit development approved and through the county. So they brought a fabulous team of, of individuals from California to work on that with a fabulous group in Douglas County. Well, common sense, they, the, the, the leadership, the county commissioners, planning commission, fabulous people who are dealing with something quite complex, quite new, and they applied enormous common sense to it. And the Mission Viejo people were so extraordinarily ethical in everything that they did. <clears throat> every, every, every promise that was made was put in writing. It was, it was agreed that everything that they said they were going to do, they would do and review it annually with the county commissioners. I mean, the, the trust factor and the good faith factor were, were, were hallmarks of the best that there is in, in, in development. So I, um, I heard from Phil Riley, who was the president of, of uh, Mission Viejo Company in California. He had me come out to, uh, to California to meet with him. Then my wife and I came out, Elizabeth and I went out, and they offered the job, and it was unbelievable. I mean, the opportunity. But I have to say, um, I had no background, no uh, no real expertise in any of the things that I was being called upon to do. I, I was, um, the, the title was uh, senior vice president for, just senior vice president. But under that was all of the government relations, all of the legal. Um, we, we, uh, we had a legal team that we hired from the outside. Davis, Graham, and Stubbs was our Law, law firm and you George, were inside counsel I was inside counsel we hired one guy who was an inside counsel ended up bringing Paul Pressman out here at, ultimately from Mission Viejo California to to quarterback what was what was going on and then I was responsible f for the finance uh, side of this the, the issuances of bonds the mortgages so fortunately the things I had done before 
were kind of preparation for what I was being called upon. But I have to say that uh, I was in awe of these people then and now who had come here from California, who had built Mission Viejo, California, uh, not only with Mission Viejo Company, but the Jack Robb, R-A-U-B Company. The engineering the people. The engineering people. These, these were just highly skilled, qualified, ethical people. Jim Tepfer was brought out as the, as the Colorado president of that operation. And, and I uh, really, for the first, I bet for the first six months, uh, I was just on the steepest learning curve everybody, anybody could ever be. I, I remember I'd go, go home and say, Elizabeth, I, I never made a declarative statement today. Everything I did today was a question. Why, why do we do it this way? And how can I do this? And what about that? And where can I be of help on this? Did you start officially with Mission Viejo? Yes, I started officially in uh, January of, uh, of 19... Oh, 1980, and uh, stayed there with Mission until, uh, and Mission at the time was owned by Philip Morris. And by the way, you couldn't have found a, a finer parent to have than the people at, at Philip Morris. They, they were, again, uh, amazing individuals. Yes, they were, in, they were in, the, in, in the cigarette side, they were in Miller's, they had Kraft, they were, they had a Mission Mo uh, Philip, Philip Morris uh, Credit Corporation, which helped us in, in so many areas of financing what was going on. And I have to say, uh, when, when this community was getting started, it, they, were, they got their approval in December of 1979 from Douglas County, so they started the, the hardscape construction. You, you know, you look at these roads, you, you, you Highlands Ranch Boulevard, all of those roads were built at capacity to begin with because these, these were real visionaries, the people who were doing Jim this. Jim Tepper told me that the finance people convinced them that that would be economically more advantageous to build the roads at full capacity. Yes. Even though that capacity wouldn't be needed for several years. Yes. And, and as part of the master development that, plan. That's right, and that master development plan that was done in 1979 is the essential same development that has occurred in the intervening time. Think about that, 1980, here we are, 2019. Looking at the economics as a developer of a community, how did you decide when you plotted the whole thing initially of how to allocate that and where they would go. Where, where what would go? The different density developments well, and over we, what we, period of time. We would determine what we want in the way of a density, okay? Then everything has to be programmed around that. Let's say that we've got this 150 acres here and the streets have to be designed based upon the amount of traffic that's going to be generated each day per household, and that re that relates then in, or goes into the size of the street that would be, you know, if we didn't do that, they'd be widening Highlands Ranch Parkway every other year, yeah. and so we anticipated the traffic volume that would be generated from our plan, and we would build the streets accordingly to accommodate that traffic. The big thing is if you start getting dinking around here with changing, um, you know, densities, and everything is all, let's say everything around here is all single family, and all of a sudden somebody comes in and, and uh, rezones it to high density, you know, it goes to 10 times the volume that can be generated, you know, before, uh, it, it ruins it. So everything has been calculated based upon the density that we project for those areas, and the streets are then accordingly designed to accommodate that traffic. Yeah. Well, isn't it true, too, when you were getting approval through Douglas County that you proposed a certain density? Oh, yeah. 90,000. No, that. that 120,000, yes. whatever it was. Yes. And, that, and that sort of set you know, in place what you could build. Yes. And you tried to do we it. Had to, we had to tell them ahead of time mm -hmm. what the density would be. Right for that planting area, that planting area, that planting area, and so forth. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, that's why we've had very well. You just don't hear of rezonings. I, I, you know, but you go to some places and it's just rezone, rezone, rezone. And um, but that's one of the virtues of having a big piece of ground. Were there any grand openings of Highlands Ranch a few years later? Oh, when the first uh, yes. Housing subdivisions yes. were. And, and we very carefully, uh, our, my firm designed the logos that are still in, the Epic Bird is still used today, which is uh, amazing because generally speaking, when you have um, new advertising agencies and new communications firms, the first thing they want to do is to change the logo and change the name. We said we thought the name Highlands Ranch and that it would not, should never be referred to as a housing community or subdivision. It was the new town of Highlands Ranch. And we should be very, very careful to designate that it was indeed going to be a town in which many people would live. And it would be literally at some point in time from the rocking of the cradle to the rolling of the hearse, there would be all kinds of generations that would live there. And so, um, the grand opening was much more d d uh, tied to the Scottish Highlands kind of a theme, and it was the opening of the new town of Highlands Ranch. And it was a Saturday morning, and there were parades, and Tweet Kimball was our grand marshal of the parade. She led the band, and, and because it was her arrangement in, in negotiations with Mission Viejo Company, Phil Riley, well, that led was, to that wonderful uh, buffer, land buffer. certainly influential in the Planning Commission for Douglas County. Yes, yes. And, and she ended up, she wasn't in favor of Mission Viejo, frankly, in the beginning, because she thought, oh my God, a, a large community of homes ne near her, she wasn't happy with it. But by the time she saw the plans and saw the well thought out and and Phil Riley suggested to her that if the 10,000 acres to the south of the property would remain an open space, why didn't she put her 5,000 acres to the north of her property together and there would be a wonderful open space? Um, she, they agreed to that and that's where all that wonderful open space comes from that is just to the south of the is in perpetuity. Yep. Yeah. Negotiation. People yeah. ask me occasionally, well, the backcountry of Islands Ranch ever be built on? And the short answer is no. No. Yeah. That was part of the agreement. Right, right. Yeah. And and it was uh, all done uh, with a lunch with Tweet Kimball and and um, um, and Phil Riley and Jim Jefford. There's a wonderful resource in the history room in the upstairs of the Highlands Ranch mansion today. And there are copies that have been saved of the Highlands Ranch Reporter from the first part of 1981, when the community was just mm -hmm. getting started, right. through 1988, when I think it became the Highlands Ranch Herald at this point. And there's a picture from that grand opening and the ribbon cutting with the people you just talked about right? who were there on the opening. Right. I think we wrote and edited the first Highlands Ranch Reporter. Because the reporter was more of an in-house organ for yes. Mission Viejo for right. the first five, right. six years. Exactly. Uh, I, I don't know that many years, but it was, uh, was part of our assignment to, to do that, to, to communicate what was happening. To communicate not only with future home buyers, prospective home buyers, but also the community, the planners and the... Yeah, so it's a wonderful resource yeah. that's been maintained there if right. somebody it's wants great. to... Yeah. Look at the history of the first few years, the first right. decade of right. Islands Ranch and how it grew. Right. There were three, um, three projects, three ho different housing groups. I think they were $20,000 apart in pricing. Um, and the Northridge Community, Northridge Recreation Center, that was the first park. Um, and we wanted to get the brochures done, the little, perhaps off the storyline, but we wanted to get the brochures done and there was no sod planted because they hadn't laid all of the cement and the things that needed to go in ahead of time. So in the, the long before the days of electronic digital where you could layer in acres and acres of grass, 
we had a retoucher put all the grass in, layer all the grass in and, all, and the flowers as though it existed so we could get the brochure printed in time. The first residents moved in in the fall of 1981. Um, and how did you welcome them? New, the new <laughs> how many were there? Oh, it was right there off Broadway. Uh, and you're right, it was the fall of 81, October, November, I think they came in. And uh, what we did is, but, you know, let's start communicating with the residents. These are the folks that are going to make the success of this community. So, four of us dressed up for Thanksgiving. The three of them as pilgrims, and of course me as the turkey. <laughs> And we distributed, I think, was 35 turkeys to the new families that were living in Highlands Ranch, just as a welcome to them as the initial residents. Thank you, and we hope you're going to have a wonderful time. Yeah. The initial resident still lives in Highlands Ranch. It's, it's amazing. I bet they were very surprised. Yeah. <laughs> and was... then after Thanksgiving came other family-type holidays, and how did Mission then well, know, we... the residents? We really wanted to, you know, the success, I believe, was communicating and getting the residents involved in activities. You could publicize this new town of Highlands Ranch in the newspapers or on the radio ad or sign boards or things like that. But the best way I found, and I believe in, was through the residents. The residents will come if they enjoy the community, if they enjoy the activities, they go back to work the next day, they go to the bridge club, they go to their activities, their schools, and they talk about the activity that they did that weekend. What they did, who their friends were, what they're meeting, what's going on. That was the basic success for getting Highlands Ranch on the map, getting them known to what's happening in the community. Well, what we did then was extended that first little activity that I just related about uh, Thanksgiving, and we were going to establish an activities committee of the residents, the HRAC, Highlands Ranch Activities Committee, and they would be the residents themselves planning their events and carrying them out. So we got notification to all the new residents, said we're going to have a meeting of the residents and talk about what we're going to do as fun times here in this new town. And uh, what was that? It was the introduction to Highlands Ranch Activities Committee. And right away comes the first holiday event, which was Christmas time. And so we did, I patterned it after California because it was successful there. I said, let's have Santa's arrival. And all the kids come down and greet Santa and talk to Santa and make their wishes known. And we had Santa located. We, I called back to California, I said, folks, send me a picture of Santa's workshop. Uh, the red and white Santa's workshop with the white picket fences along it and everything. We're gonna have a Santa and we're gonna have him come in and talk to the kids. And they sent the picture, I sent it right over to a little construction group, people said, please get this made so we can have it by the middle of December. And that weekend in the middle. And we're, they said, well, okay, we'll do it. And we had a publication, I forget what it was, it wasn't the Highlands Ranch Herald yet, I don't believe at that time, which was our normal eventual community information document. Okay, I'm Gary Danny. Uh, I moved out here in 1981. Uh, my brother was a senior executive with Mission Bay of California. I moved out here in 78 when they first bought the property to start developing that. My story is after that, I was in banking back in Michigan uh, and I came out here on vacation in July of 81 and my brother, they had a, they had a picnic, the company picnic was at the mansion, the front, front uh, of the mansion there and uh, my brother arranged it. I met with a guy by the name of Joe Lamberta and Joe Blake at the picnic, had some beers with them, talked to them and, uh, and so uh, at the end of the picnic, uh, Joe Blake said, you know, you want to work for us as a as manager of production control. This is July of 81. I was in charge of getting that going. So I was manager of production control. I put the schedule together, how many homes we wanted to sell, 
And then I met with all the heads of the department every week to see where we're at. Because you had, you know, you had to have the uh, uh, the building, uh, you had to have the marketing, you had to have the land development, and all these things had to coordinate. So at the at a certain point in the starting house, you have a piece of land, and you have the guys developing the plans for the house, uh, architectural plans, and they, you know, they want to meet at this point to start building, and then from there on you follow the schedule, and then you want to sell the homes until you want to make sure the home's done when you sell them. So did, I'm did you have that kind of background? No, I didn't. I was in banking. I was actually a, uh, I was a uh, uh, in banking for eight years before that, before moving out here, but. Uh, uh, the only reason I got the job, to be quite honest with you, is probably because of my brother, uh, who set all this up. And then okay. At the end of the, at the end of the uh, deal, they offered me a job, and my wife and I stood on the front steps of the mansion. Nothing was built out here yet. It was about eight o'clock at night. The sun was going down. Beautiful sunset. It was in July, and she's pregnant with my daughter. This she is your wife, Carol. 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 She's pregnant with my daughter, Jenny. And she's about uh, probably well, the baby was born in October, so she was six months pregnant. And we sit in front of, I had a really good job. I was in banking and being groomed the president of a bank back in Michigan. And we sat and go, let's move to Colorado. That's good. Well, let's transition into one of the first major activities that might have come from the influence of Michigan Viejo in California. You and others moved in in the late summer, early fall of 81. Mm -hmm. And I understand that, like at Mission Viejo in California, an activities committee was organized. Right. right. Tell me about that. Well, in October of 81, uh, late October, our cook came and said, let's start an activities committee. And I knew our cook really well because I worked with him. And so I was one of the first guys he talked to. So I talked to my neighbors and I talked to a bunch of people. What was Art's responsibility at that point? Art was a uh, ranch and, and his... He was in charge of the activities committee from day one until they left in around 1990, somewhere around in that. Uh, that was a big deal. That was his big deal. We we're always working on events. We had tons of events going on to bring that community together. It's community spirit, and they were fun deals. But we, the first meeting, we probably had about you know, 20 people there, and the first meeting was to uh, set up Santa's arrival. Uh, and actually, Santa's arrival was the Sunday after Thanksgiving. It was always that day. In 1981, and so that was modern, modeled after what had happened in California. Right, modeled after what happened in California. Mm -hmm. Santa's arrival. What happened is all the homeowners decorated all the lights on the streets. Broadway. We only had Broadway on the streets. We only had Broadway with the big tall trees on it. We got out there and cold. I still remember very cold, and we decorated all those trees. Got up on 14 foot ladders and put bulbs all over. And we had ton Mission Bay paid for everything. You know, we. Had, we Money was not an option, it was just a help type of deal. So we put that all together. My neighbor and his pictures in here, Tom Brennan, uh, we built the first mailbox. And they still use that mailbox today. I saw it out there this this year next to Santa's house. We put a mailbox, we built a mailbox. And letters, to, letters to Santa? Letters to Santa, my kids, and they're all the kids here. And there was a lady here, uh, Chris Valenti, was a very good friend of mine, still a good friend of mine today. She did live here in the ranch. And she knew these kids, so the kids would put the letters in there. And then she'd write back mm -hmm. and say, "Yeah, uh, Santa realized that you lost your tooth last month, and you know you, you know, you're not feeling too good, or you, know, you broke your leg during the time." And the kids are going crazy because they got these letters from Santa, and they said, "How does Santa Claus know all that?" So what happened is we did all this work, we put it all together, the activities committee, and then we had Santa's arrival came in in a fire truck, and, and Art Cook got on his two-way telephone talking to Santa and directed them here to Highlands Ranch, and you're almost here, Santa. Oh, you're lost. We're going to turn the lights on for you so you can see where you're going, and we turned all the lights on, and the kids went crazy. We're singing songs at the same time. Well, kids just the, went crazy. Well, was the community that well, first we probably had maybe season. 60 people out there for the first hand of the rifle. Uh, I think they, uh, at that time, uh, they probably had about 30 pounds sold uh, at most. Mm -hmm. yeah, but everybody, 90% of the people, maybe 95% of the yeah. people lived here at the time were out there at that ceremony. And boy, what a feeling. Mm -hmm. And then the kids are going crazy. And uh, so we turn on the lights, and then Santa Claus, the fire truck starts going and turns the corner, and the kids. So it was a neat event. Oh, well, I mean, and, and, and at, at, uh, at the uh, branding uh, time, uh, we would have the whole community out for a big community uh, picnic. 
I mean, it was a big deal for three or four years. You'd have, well, the initial, you might have had 50 people, then you had 400 people, then you had maybe 1,000, and then, you know, that's one thing that you learned in this, um, and, and that is that you had to retell the story all the time because you had people moving in who were not aware of what the promises were of what, of what, what we are trying to accomplish. And so our communication with our own constituents was a really important aspect of why we were so successful. I saw several pictures that occurred at the Highlands Ranch Mansion, which was definitely a community-oriented yes. activity. Yes. Our cook was known for his pit barbecues That's out right. in the backyard. That's exactly right. And I even saw at one point um, a swimming pool. Yes. That's a slide. That's right. Was that an, which now is on the outside of the metal fence. That's right. Was that an in-ground pool? From what you recall? Yes, I think I so. I think it was. Yeah, I think so. the photos that I've seen. Yeah. And some place later on that kind of disappeared. But right. You know, you, 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 I, thank you for bringing that up because the way in which Mission and those early plans um, celebrated the history of, of Highlands Ranch, that mansion, everything south, you know, that's left open. That's left open. Uh, the, the, the windmill, the, the stone windmill, the open sense that it, it's, it's some of the most beautiful area and the most beautiful area in Highlands Ranch was part of the, of the uh, conservation easement. Well, one final comment for me from watching the 400 pictures and reading your story and all. From the pictures in particular, it seemed like um, you guys knew how to throw good parties. That we did. Very family oriented. Yes, I was going to say they were family and oriented. It looked like they had a good oh. time. We, they did, and the food was fantastic, even though the cook prepared it. And uh, but I, I don't remember ever finding somebody drunk and laying on the ground or anything like that. Do you? It was free beer. That's why. Uh, <laughs> those pictures. Those pictures. It's you can tell it was a different time because the hairstyles oh, were different. The shorts that even the guys wore were much Short. shorter than they are today, rather than these things that are halfway down your legs or whatever. And there was a lot of Miller Lite that seemed to show up in those pictures. Miller beer was part of Philip Morris. <laughs> yeah, that's why there that's was a why, lot of Miller Lite that, yeah, but, uh, that seemed to show up in those pictures. I didn't get that beer, connection. Uh, um, became I a was, very good friend of the company. I, and, I was amused by the pictures of the kids with what appeared to be a holding on to the back legs of the pig. Oh, that was our, yeah, that was our, remember we had the, the grease, grease pig, pig contest. The grease pig contest. Yeah. The pig contest. Tell me about that. Well, we'd grease them up and then kids would have to catch do them. And it catch wasn't them. just kids, wasn't it adults? And adults. Management oh, they, too? We did I, both, I think. I, they, I, 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 I saw some management pictures look like they were eyeing these pigs. I'm going to lower myself. Oh, no, you rode the tricycle, remember? <laughs> oh, oh, I lost. Right out, <laughs> right out of here, by the way. It was all rigged. Oh. Jack Rob rigged it. My he, bicycle didn't. he didn't. Yes, he did. He rigged it. My, my bicycle wouldn't work. <laughs> we, we had a fun time. We did. We, uh, we did. So, Donna, thank you for sharing all those oh, pictures. They gave me uh, an insight of really what Sounds like you well, have an incredible company orient Thank you. orientation, and obviously we've lived and we live in this community now and um, benefit from the, the fruits of all of your collective efforts. Well, it's, thank you. For and I wanted to thank you on behalf of the Historical Society for spending a couple hours with us today and well, regaling us with some of the stories. particular about your people that... <laughs> Well, you some wait. things can't be helped. <laughs> Don't you know you're loved? Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, no. Okay. So I'm going to give you the final, the final word. I, I appreciate you giving me the time to talk, and I could keep talking, as you know, probably for another seven or twelve hours. <laughs> you know, there are are so many things. The historical society. Uh, what happened to the cheese ranch? problems we had with that, and, and uh, the groups that we thought we were building this underground city, and, and uh, I, I, 
and so many funny things, you know, that you never would think would be a part of a development project, but so many things affected so many of the residents, and, and the people enjoy living in these places. They enjoy a mission, and um, they're running out of money and want to expand the big pool at mission. Oh. They need about a million four. So they're looking to you for that. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to have so to shut this off. Nice, uh, thank, thank you. You're not too hard, and I got to walk home now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Joe, among other things, when the infrastructure was being developed in the early 80s for this new community, transportation always comes up as an issue. Is the transportation highways that are being built going to be satisfactory to support the different zoning portions as part of the plan? And also the whole issue of public transportation. Did you have any involvement in helping shape what became in the transportation plan? Thank you for asking that. Um, in the initial plan unit development guide, the, there were a couple of, um, uh, uh, of elements that, that mission in planning this wanted to be sure that internally, uh, because people were gonna live and work here, that they would not be a burden in terms of, of going outside the community if they, if they were gonna be able to work. So they wanted to build uh, on the highway side, on the road side, at, at maximum, and we've talked about that. <clears throat> they also had a, a, an idea of doing <clears throat> a, a, um, an internal transit uh, system where they would have buses moving from place to place to try to reduce traffic. Um, but it was funny because Highlands Ranch was not part of the regional transportation district. Uh, it had been originally, uh, but they had taken the property owners and everybody else, and particularly portions of Parker and Castle Rock had taken themselves out of, of RTD. And I had uh, two great friends who were in the General Assembly, um, one of whom is now deceased, who had been in the FBI, was in law school with me and a great leader in the General Assembly and uh, a, a lady who had worked with me when I was a Denver County Republican chairman and then in her own right served in the legislature and in Denver City Council. But at this time she's in the legislature and Elizabeth and I, had, uh, we knew them both socially. Uh, they were not married but we drove them up to, uh, one evening we drove them up to Daniels Park. It was a beautiful evening and they're having such a great time, and they, in, in one of those little innocent moments, they say, now, Joe, is there anything we could, is there anything you need? What, what, could, you, what could you want, Joe? Is there anything you want? I say, you know, there is something. I, 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 I want to get Highlands Ranch in the regional transportation district. Oh, they said, well, let's see what we can do. You know they've took it about. There's a little bit of antagonism around others who've been paying in their this uh, fee, uh, this sales tax, but... Is that a half a percent or whatever? It was a, maybe, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. So we, we dreamt up this whole thing, and, um, and we got Highlands Ranch, by meets and bounds, uh, annexed in, back into the R RTD. And it, I, I, one of my great photographs somewhere in the house, I, we all have photographs we wish we could find, was the first bus that came in at the, there at the town center uh, with the zero, uh, which was the, the, the Broadway. number, the Broadway. And uh, thank you, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And ironically, ironically, so that, that, that relieved mission of a lot of, um, mm -hmm. uh, of, a lot of uh, pain and suffering and investment that we, we got the RTD. People always say that you know things happen from people who know each other. They do, and, 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 and who know and trust each other. Yeah. But it's so funny because my office today as Chancellor Emeritus is down on 17th and Glenarm. And I've got a corner office and I look out and every day here comes the Highlands Ranch Zero bus passing by it. it just, it's, yep. a, it's a sense of joy. It's great. As the new sheriff of a growing county, 
<clears throat> was to see if you could solve the problem of the sheriff's office not having a place to train. Right. Uh, that was particularly one. firearms training. That right. You were at the Douglas County Fairgrounds at that point? Yes. Yeah, we were at the Douglas County Fairgrounds just a couple hundred yards from Wilcox Street. Well, I firing, that wasn't good. Firing into a berm that yeah. was that ran alongside uh, Wilcox. Not good. Not good and very unsafe. And by my being exposed to some of the other sheriffs and police chiefs of the metro area here, nobody had a reasonable place to do any training. What well, was Arapaho doing at that point? Arapaho was shooting down in a gully right down here at the end of Broadway. Yeah. And uh, they had no place to go. Uh, and uh, every once in a while, Aurora PD had a small range that you could probably put five to ten people on. And it These was are outdoor out ranges now? And it was out to out at Lorry, Lorry by mm -hmm. the Lorry yeah. base there. And uh, but then you had to schedule it and you had to make that long drive out there and uh, it, it really didn't kind of avail itself to the type of training that needed to be done. It was just basically shoot at a single target, do your shooting, and then leave. And uh, so anyhow. It was a big issue for all, especially the agencies in the South Metro area. And so I kind of assigned my undersheriff to go out and try to find a place where we could build our own facility. And he did that. And it seems like every place that we found, somebody else had uh, uh, plans for, you know. And uh, kind of a funny story, uh, the, the last place was the old Arapaho dump there at Colorado and, uh, four, and 470, there used to be the old dump there. And uh, we had told the commissioners that uh, if they're going to take that out of service, why not give it to us and we could open a firearms facility out there. About a week later, I got this call from the, the former president of Mission Viejo, Jim Teffer, and he says, I heard you want to build a range out on Colorado and 470. And he says, yeah, we have it already designed. He says, well, we're going to build homes there. <laughs> and I said, oh. And uh, he said, give me two weeks. So he, I gave him two weeks. And he said, meet me down at where we are now, just uh, about a mile and a half south of Titan Road. And he said, well, what would you think about this place? So him and Joe Blake and I and my undersheriff went out there. He says, we'll lease you this property for a dollar a year for the next 99 years. And I said, you can't beat that. So yeah. we said, we'll take it. Dr. Beeman, do you have anything else you'd like uh, well, us to know about? Uh, the, uh, the development of Island Ranch was something that my father said, I hope they put the houses fairly close together so they don't have just patches of destroyed grass. He would be very pleased with what's mm -hmm. taken place with it. Yeah. And they left the backcountry yeah. the best part. Yeah. Oh. yeah.